Okay. Hi and welcome to this uh, panel on questionable publishing across countries. My name is Gustav Nelhans and I'm a senior lecturer at Swedish School of Library and Information Science at the University of Borås. And it's a privilege to chair this event where we have a distinguished set of uh, presenters that will talk about uh, uh, this issue from three different perspectives. It is Tove Faber Fransen from the University of Southern Denmark who will talk about the researcher both as an author as, and as involved in editorial practices with regards to questionable publishing or affected by. We have Jakarija Rahman from Chalmers University of Technology who will talk about issues concerning the professional sanitation in library practice, especially about whitelists. We then have two talks highlighting policy issues, one by Raf Gans from University of Antwerp on international comparisons and a joint talk by Jana Pölönen from Federation of Finnish Learned Societies and Gunnar Sivertsen from NIFU uh, uh, on the grey zone between aspects of uh, um, proper and predatory publishing. Intermingled with these presentations, we intend to engage you, the audience, in some Mentimeter polls where we have singled out a dilemma or an issue that we would like you to react to. And we also encourage you to submit comments uh, to the presenters. In the end, then, we will try to summarize the discussions in light of, of the comments received. Of course, time is quite scarce, so we might not have time to discuss them all, but maybe we will be able to come back in some other forum with some of the uh, issues that will be brought up here. And of course, this is a very broad issue in many ways. Yeah, uh, because uh, the, the topic of questionable publishing with regards to scientometrics is a very uh, topical one. Uh, on the first day of the conference, at least two of the sessions were very involved uh, or brought up these issues, both the one about uh, academic uh, integrity or academic freedom and the one about open access. And not least, uh, the uh, last week's attention in the scientometric community uh, showed uh, the broad relevance uh, uh, since one of the field's journals, Scientometrics, recently retracted an article after representatives from a publisher accused it of potential, uh, 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 a publisher that is accused, sometimes accused of potential predatory publishing practices, made formal complaints. There is also a note of concern in uh, research evaluation for, uh, for another article which also uh, named uh, another publisher. There might be grounds for self-reflection regarding the sources we use in our research, so those might be relevant issues. But in my view, it's very problematic when commercial actors uh, uh, seem to meddle with the editorial process, as has been brought up by others also. And one last note before we start is about the terminology. I often use the term questionable publishing, both because, uh, as we will see in the following presentations, there is not a, uh, always a clear sense of who is actually the predator and who is the actual prey, meaning that there are many different reasons for questionable publishing to occur, in my view. Uh, the other is that from a science studies perspective, uh, it's highly problematic to use the expected uh, outcomes or conclusions of our research as a starting point of our studies, especially when it is a pretty new phenomenon that, uh, and with an extent that has not been thoroughly studied yet. But with this in mind, I will give the word now to Tove, and please, welcome. Thank you, Gustav. Um, I'm going to present some researcher perspectives on um, questionable publishing. And researchers can be involved with questionable publishing uh, or questionable journals as authors, as peer reviewers and editorial board members or editors. And the existing literature generally shows that researchers engaged with questionable publishing or questionable journals are young they're typically early career researchers. They are inexperienced, so they have little experience with the process of publishing research. And we also see that some regions and countries are overrepresented when we analyze uh, the researchers engaged with these journals. However, we also find highly experienced researchers engaging with questionable journals. So it's not just young and inexperienced researchers um, engaging with these journals. So why do researchers engage with these journals? Um, some of the scholars that um, are engaged with questionable journals are uh, unethical and their choice of journal can be considered deliberate misconduct or 
uh, questionable research practice. However, many of the researchers are just unaware. And there are numerous reasons for engaging with questionable publication outlets. Among the factors are that the author may have had previous experience of rejection, uh, maybe for a specific paper a number of times, and may therefore target what they expect to be a low barrier publication outlet. Finances may also be a reason for choosing a specific journal. Uh, some institutions pay by the paper and the payout may depend on the publication outlet. So it may be on the basis of being a Scopus Index journal or being a journal on a specific list. Little knowledge of the field and the publication outlets within the field uh, may influence the choice of journal as the choice may be less informed and more uh, a case of chance. And finally, when a researcher applies for a faculty position or a promotion, more publications and editorial board involvement may be an advantage, and that may be a reason for some to, in, to engage with a questionable journal. It has been claimed that fast-tracking promotion by the use of questionable publication outlets is an increasing problem as scholars see the strategy working well for their colleagues and they would also like to fast track their career. So the problem in that sense would be spreading. The term zombie professor has been used to characterize a professorship achieved without proper academic merit. So that you build a career primarily on publications in questionable journals. We have little knowledge of the number of these so-called zombie professors. The majority of researchers may just be unaware and their paper is not necessarily questionable in any way. But there may be a risk of overestimating the number of unethical authors because we tend to pay uh, disproportionate attention to extreme cases. They, they get our attention. I'll now take you through a, um, an example of uh, researchers engaged in questionable journals. It's a recent study of reviewers, and the study finds that very few scholars submitted reviews predominantly or exclusively for questionable journals. So most scholars in this study submitted reviews for, uh, never submitted reviews for questionable journals. So that's 90% of the authors or the reviewers in the study. Few scholars reviewed occasionally or rarely, so about 10%. And very few scholars submitted reviews predominantly or exclusively for questionable journals. Uh, in this case, less than 1% of the scholars reviewed for questionable journals in more than 75% of their reviews. So they um, predominantly or exclusively reviewed for questionable journals. So these shares are remarkably low. Uh, we should note, though, that the reviewers might be less likely to claim a review for a questionable or a low quality journal, and this would lead to underestimated shares of questionable reviews in the, in the analysis. We now turn our attention to the authors of publication in questionable journals, and we find that very few scholars publish predominantly or exclusively in questionable journals. So if we start with the authors that predominantly publish in questionable journals, we find that 3% of the authors with two or more publications in a questionable journal publish 75% or more of their publications in questionable journals. And to look for some of the more extreme cases, uh, we find 54 authors that publish 10 or more articles uh, or reviews in questionable journals, and they publish 75% or more of their entire um, publication uh, publications in questionable journals. So if we now look at the authors that exclusively publish in questionable journals, then we find 2.6% of authors with two or more publications in questionable journals that publish exclusively in questionable journals. And again, looking for the more extreme cases, uh, 21 authors publish 10 or more articles or reviews in questionable journals, and they publish exclusively in these journals. 
So considering that the total number of unique authors in the study is over 170,000, there seems to be relatively few authors specifically targeting these journals to fast track a promotion or to build a career. But again, the shares of questionable publications may be underestimated because in this case, local questionable publications outlets uh, are not included. And summing up, uh, it may not be a widespread problem that researchers target questionable journals systematically to build a career. However, it is a recurrent theme of interest and debate in the discussion of publishing through these publication outlets, how these publications are affecting the scientific literature and the scientific community as a whole. So questionable journals have been accused of threatening the academic integrity as well as threatening the um, the research publication as such. Um, publications in questionable journals are characterized typically by a lower study and reporting quality, but the extent of the problem is debated. A recent review of the literature suggests that publishing decisions should be understood situated within a system of incentives, pressures and expectations. So if authors are pressured or expected to publish in a certain set of journals and they are given the incentives to do so, uh, we would expect to see more publications in these journals. So therefore, from a researcher perspective, it is important to consider expectations and more specifically pressures and incentives when addressing the issue of questionable journals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tove. And uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, I would have to start the poll also. Yes, based on on uh, the discussion here by Tove, we uh, uh, saw some numbers and and the shares of, of the uh, the number of people who actually uh, publish uh, exclusively in questionable uh, journals as a quite low uh, number. So uh, with that in mind, uh, we have a, a, a poll here asking um, uh, that the, the pre predominant and or exclusive use of questionable journals is rare and therefore we can just ignore their presence in, the, in bibliometric studies. That's a statement and we would like you to answer to that. Yes, thank you. Uh, and without further ado, I, I uh, show you the result here. Here, and uh, well, uh, can I ask you to uh, what do you think about the, the results here? There is a quite large share of, of uh, uh, responses here about the disagree uh, answer. Yes, I think that that we, in other cases, we do uh, accept anomalies in the data set. But in this case, I think that generally there's a, a strong opinion to to address the issue when we are doing bibliometric studies. So I think that that's uh, it's interesting to see that that this also seems to be the case for the audience today. Thank you very much, Tove. And please, if there are any questions, you can submit them and we will bring them to the discussion uh, in the end. But I will st stop here. Let's see. Let's see. Let's go to the next presenter then. And this is uh, Jakarija Raman, uh, who will talk about uh, uh, issues concerning uh, question and publishing uh, with regards to the professional centimetrician. Please. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jakari Roman. I am working as a bibliometric analyst at the University, Chalmers University of Technology. 
Today I will share some of my experience as a bibliometrician while working with the researcher and also the research evaluator. So let's see uh, uh, my experience. Uh, also the experiences included with my colleagues here. So what's happened, as you understand that, uh, that we, the bibliometrician, are at crossroad, and why we are saying this one. Uh, so usually uh, when we uh, request, uh, when we receive a request from the researcher, then we usually suggest them that, okay, you should publish in a journal that is indexed in either Web of Science or Scopus. And also sometimes we suggest that you should check the Simago journal ranking and for uh, more analysis or CWTS uh, journal indicators. So uh, as a bibliometrician, we have these are uh, these kinds of tools uh, that help them to understand okay whether this journal is legitimate or not, and how and also the uh, bibliometric indicators, how the journals is performed, and whether the people uh, they want to reach with their articles, uh, whether those people are uh, uh, reading those articles or not, which subject categories they have covered. These kinds of information we know as a scientometrician or bibliometrician that this help help us. But what we don't know, what we cannot suggest that. Uh, this database don't show us any quality of information. Uh, if there is something going on in the back, uh, that's not really related to bibliometrics actually. Uh, there's the editorial process or the aggressive business model of a publishers or the uh, pressure from the uh, publisher or the editorial malpractice. We don't know. Then who knows these kinds of things? These things knows uh, much uh, before than us, the bibliometrician or even the uh, uh, citation databases, the researcher who are actually working on that field. So sometimes it happened that uh, we suggest uh, one journal, okay, you can and go for this journal and after six months or one year, we found that that journal dropped from the citation database. So what's happened in the meantime? Something's happened. That's why you dropped that journal. So. Our understanding that why not we come to know about these kinds of practice beforehand and how can we know about this one? So I am just sharing you here an example. Uh, this is uh, I have taken from a newsletter that the sustainability uh, research, research network newsletter. And here, the researcher who actually work on the sustainability, they have shared their experience. Uh, for example, uh, one editor wrote that uh, he has to do uh, one manuscript per week and expected to complete uh, my assignment that day or forward it to the another editor. So these kinds of researchers are very busy. They have a very scheduled uh, schedule. They have to do a lot of research and uh, their teaching uh, the, 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 uh, and also they are, they have PhD students, postdoc. So, so they have a busy, busy uh, schedule. And on the top of that, if the publishers uh, force them um, to do these kinds of things, I mean, he has written that reviewers are not given much time either. Uh, re uh, revisions are typically due within two weeks. If it is a major revision, it's very tough. And even uh, he has written that final decision and typically within the day. So when you receive a an, uh, review from the reviewers, and then uh, how can you take a final decision within the day? So it's a very pathetic. But this kind of information uh, is not known by the citation database. Only the people who work in the research field and uh, working as an editorial board or reviewer, they know about this one. And there is another example uh, that uh, the uh, uh, three people has been offered to be a editorial board uh, guest editor uh, in, in a, uh, a special issue, issue and they withdraw, uh, at the end they withdraw themselves from the special issue due to the malpractice of the review process of the publisher. But unfortunately, that special issue is, is still visible and their name is there. So as a researcher, what we understand that those people who are in the editor, they have reviewed my papers, isn't it? I mean, if you don't know the uh, background story, you always believe and you also believe on their uh, contribution. And then there is also, I have taken another one from Dr. Thomas. Uh, he mentioned that this is not the, a small problem, it's a large part of the larger problem. Uh, just for example, on several occasions, I have rejected papers for fundamental mythological flaws only to see them published on chess in a different AISI ranked journal later. So these kinds of things we cannot uh, know through the citation database, but only the researcher who work on the field, uh, they know. Just for example, how this can affect, I mean, when researcher reported something, 
just for example, as a national level awareness, uh, not every nation have a list uh, like a Norwegian list or Swedish or Finnish list. But uh, just for example, here, uh, the Norwegian publication indicator, they drop uh, the journal sustainability in a gray zone. So this is a confusion. But if you look on the citation databases, this journal is still uh, performing good in uh, both the scopus and Web of Science. If you look on CWTS uh, journal indicators or CMAGO journal ranking, these are still fine. But the question is that uh, only the some um, countries or some um, people know about this one, these kinds of lists, and not everyone is following this one. So our concern is that what to do for the uh, bigger advantage, I mean, for, for the uh, all the countries, because we are heavily depends on these citation and databases. And also another case that there is a misperception grows in research there. Uh, when there is a research evaluation, we need to work as a bibliometrician with the uh, research evaluator. Uh, then somebody come with this uh, Dora principle, then comes that, okay, the need of eliminate the use of journal based uh, metrics, there is no need. Uh, so what's the difference? What's the difference uh, if you don't use the journal metrics? How can you make a difference between paid and non paid journals? And also the, 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 they show us that, okay, the, you, you should assess our article uh, and the quality of the article, not the where we have published. <laughs> So this gives a sense of the needless of following the blacklist or whitelist of journal and forking the gray journal. So these are the things happening. And so when we are in communication with the researcher, we come to know about these kinds of things uh, much earlier, uh, but uh, we cannot do actually anything. Still, we are suggesting that, okay, you, you need to be a little bit aware about this one and uh, follow your community, what the other researchers are doing, talk to your research group, talk to your supervisor, like these kinds of things. So at the end, uh, I would like to send some suggestions that uh, we understand that uh, the citation databases are already contaminated because sometimes we found that some journals dropped uh, from the, the databases, but uh, it has also already performed for five or six years, very good, and then dropped. So there is some reasons behind it, but we only know when uh, some journals are dropped from there. Uh, so. Uh, we have responsibility as a bibliometrician, as a citation database, and also the researcher, they have uh, their responsibility. So we suggest that the researcher should raise their voice uh, and try to stop sending their research to the, the gray journal or predatory journals and stop uh, step down as a review or editorial board member and uh, announce it. Now we, we are in Web 2.0, we have social media, you can announce it very easily. And also the citation database should allow open and feedback from the researcher uh, about an index journal. So as a researcher, uh, you have an uh, uh, Scopus author ID or Web of Science or, or researcher ID. So when the citation database believe you as a researcher based on your research, so they have to believe on you based on your uh, author ID that if you put something, uh, some complaint about the uh, practice of the publisher of the journal or malpractice, then they have to believe it and they have to consider these kinds of information on uh, for, for evaluating the journals. And the journal selection panel of the citation database should consider relevant researcher feedback before and after indexing a journal. And there is a much bigger issue that uh, the research evaluator organization should agree on acceptable bibliometric indicators for journals. And it, it should be acceptable for, for all the countries, not in a very specific cases. I mean, the one country follow one indicators and another countries follow another indicators. Uh, so this created a problem. So that's my presentation. If you have any question, please uh, let us know. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jakob. Uh, and we will start uh, a poll here. It will take a couple of seconds until you see it. Uh, so with regards to, to public mandates, such as the San Francisco Declaration, Adora, for example, uh, they might come into conflict with using blacklists or, or whitelists. Uh, and and uh, of course, there, there's an issue then uh, with with, uh, with uh, combining uh, these different mandates that, that, that there are. Uh, it is also an issue with how, uh, yeah, let's, let's go to the actual question instead here. So th the question then is, you should not use journal quality as an indicator uh, of article co quality uh, in light of questionable publishing for the reasons of, for example, DORA issue.
Thank you very much. And here we have the results. Uh, and this is a negative question and uh, there is a disagreement towards the, the negative statements. So uh, then there is a slight uh, predominance of, of responses arguing for using uh, general quality as, as indicator for then, in this case, uh, good uh, uh, publishing practices. Uh, Jakarida, would you like to say something about this? this uh, yeah. Uh, I would like to say that uh, we should use journal indicators because uh, you, you know it also make a, a great difference uh, between the petri and the non petri because the uh, non petri journals are not indexed in citation databases and as a scientometrician or bibliometrician we believe on these databases and, and the uh, journal indicators and other indicators uh, help us to decide what to publish and when not to publish uh, these kinds of information and also uh, uh, it's a matter of debate that uh, whether uh, it should reflect that uh, the quality of uh, your own article or not, uh, that's different things. But uh, uh, if, if you just uh, don't consider, if you don't want to consider any indicator, but uh, in, uh, if you publish your quality things in a, a newly journal and you publish in a, uh, in a, in a publisher nature, so that makes sense. So uh, you, <laughs> the quality of the uh, journal without reading the article, actually. OK, thank you very much. Let's see if the poll also will stop showing. There's a brief lag here in the system, which I need to take into account when I moderate this. But it will stop soon. Well, uh, I would like to start to uh, introduce the next uh, speaker then, uh, who is uh, Raf Gans, who will talk about questionable publishing uh, in an international comparison. Please, Raf. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Gustav, and hello, everyone. Uh, so this is about international comparisons and more precisely, the question uh, that I'd like to talk about is how can we study the prevalence of questionable publishing at the country level? So there, there are two entities of interest. On the one hand, we have countries. On the, on the other hand, we have journals. And for the journals, we have um, legitimate journals, the green ones, and we have bad, predatory, questionable journals, the red ones with the predator on the front, uh, to make it very obvious. Um, and I think there are basically two ways or two perspectives by which we can study this. Um, and most studies take a journal-first perspective where we start from a list or a set of questionable journals and then look at the distribution of countries therein. That's what I call a journal-first perspective. But there's also another kind of study possible where we start from publication data in a country or in multiple countries and look at the distribution of journals within that country. And in fact, I think that both uh, perspectives are complementary. So um, maybe first some findings from previous journal first studies. Uh, Tove also um, mentioned some of these. Uh, for instance, there's a, an influential paper in 2015 who publishes in predatory journals where it was found that these researchers are young, inexperienced, often located in developing countries. And um, the authors link that to social, cultural, and economic conditions in those countries. More specifically, they find that 89% of authors come from Africa and South Asia, mostly uh, Nigeria and India. There are two uh, notes I want to make here. Um, first is that um, while this finding has been corroborated by some other studies, there are also studies uh, that find substantial shares of richer countries. 
Um, a second note is that um, it has been argued that there are also other explanations for um, this fairly large share of developing countries. Uh, among, other thing, among other things, it has been pointed out that, uh, for instance, Beale's List, uh, the infamous Beale's List, um, carries a strong bias against developing countries, against the global south, has been characterized as racism, xenophobia, or colonialism. So that's also a factor. What about the country first perspective? Um, there are fewer studies like that, I think, and most of them focus on just one country or region. Uh, for instance, there are two uh, papers from 2019 by some of the people involved in this session that looked at uh, Sweden and Flanders, Belgium, and they both found kind of similar results. Uh, they found a fairly large, uh, uh, sorry, a fairly small share of questionable journals, less than 1%, and the share was also decreasing. Um, on the slide shown here are figures for Sweden. And as you can see on the right hand side, um, there are some important differences between types of institutions. We don't have many studies that uh, look at it, uh, that look at multiple countries, um, which is why I'd like to present some findings from an as of yet unpublished study by uh, the people mentioned on the slide here, which compares only three countries, three European countries. So there's, um, a, it, it's, it's limited in, the, in that respect. Uh, looking at Finland, Flanders, actually only part of a country, and Poland. And as you can see, again, we find rather small shares. We also find a decrease, most clearly for Finland. Um, and interestingly, the share in Finland is um, substantially higher than in the other two which um, is most likely due to the fact that the Finnish data um, also cont contains a broader range of institutions, not just universities. When we looked at um, which journals do people actually publish in, we found uh, surprisingly little overlap. Only five journals were common to all three countries. And um, the journal with the largest number of publications overall is a journal that is uh, quite popular in Poland, apparently, but not used at all by Finnish or Flemish scholars. Uh, it's a journal shown on the slide, Actual Problems of Economics. And if you look at it, you see from, for instance, the Cyrillic writing that this is clearly a journal that's oriented towards um, mostly Central and Eastern European audience, Russian audience, and so on, um, which probably explains why um, the Western European countries don't publish in it. Um, the reason why we, uh, why these three countries uh, are, were in the study is because they are three countries with a full coverage database of research output. There are some other countries um, that have them, but of course, um, there are also um, uh, most of the most of the countries worldwide probably don't have such a database. So it's not a ideal solution. Which brings me to uh, the question, is it possible at all to do a large scale international comparison from a country first perspective? And I think there the lack of a comprehensive global um, database of research output makes such uh, larger scale international comparisons very difficult. We have, of course, Web of Science and Scopus but um, these are sources that actively try to keep out questionable journals, um, so they're limited in that respect. Uh, sources like Dimensions or Crossref are a bit uh, less restrictive, but still I think that they will miss many smaller journals, especially ones that don't issue DOIs. Um, so maybe um, some of the um, less often used sources like Google Scholar, Microsoft Academic, and, and so on, 
are a solution here, but I leave this as an open question. I would be very interested to hear what uh, you, the audience, think. Um, one final point I want to make is that um, both journal first and country first studies are of course affected by biases in the sources we use to determine what exactly should count as questionable journals. So that's um, an important consideration. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, uh, we have a, a poll question also for your talk. And uh, I think that we should use the one um, on uh, the share of publications that are uh, matched to questionable journals tends to be quite low. Um, and uh, of course, uh, as has been stated already, uh, this might be because we use uh, sources or blacklists and, and that are uh, uh, quite restrictive or uh, some might say the other way, otherwise of course but they are uh, clearly not complete we don't know exactly what, which journals actually are are there exactly and therefore it's a bit hard to uh, give these estimates but we can see some kind of of, of uh, uh, development also so the question is could uh, it does con continuous monitoring and active dissuasion uh, are necessary to keep the share of questionable publishing under control? Do you agree with this or do you disagree? Great, so we got the responses here and we will wait for the system to show it to you. But, uh, well, there's a strong inclination towards uh, stating that there is uh, a need to uh, uh, control uh, monitoring and uh, keep dissuade from using this kind of uh, publishing. Let's see if, if it comes up here. Yeah, here it comes. So, uh, yes, Raf, if I give the word to you, these are expected responses, I guess. Yes, yeah, I, I, I guess so. Um, so, in, in general, I also agree. Um, I don't know about Sweden, but I know for the case of Flanders, Belgium, there's a fairly strong case to be made that the decrease in share of uh, publications in such journals is due to monitoring and active dissuasion. Um, the only thing that I'm slightly worried about is that uh, blind use of, um, well, whatever blacklists are being used, whether it's Beale's list or Cabell's list or anything else, may also sometimes paint some journals that are not necessarily truly uh, deceptive in nature, um, may treat them as such. So that's uh, one thing we should be a bit careful about. Exactly. And, and I, I agree with this because uh, some of the criteria that are used sometimes when you define questionable publishing uh, are quite uh, weak or not directly linked to the publishing practices uh, or rather questionable pu publishing practices, but could be regarding other issues. And uh, it's hard to, to say how many of, of these criteria, for example, Cabos, I think have 65 different criteria, how many of these criteria must be uh, ticked off before you should ac actually state that this is a, a, a questionable uh, publisher. But this is something that we might come back to uh, in the end. Uh, let me now give the word to uh, Jan and Gunnar for the last uh, presentation here. And yes, please. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Jan Pölönen and this is a joint uh, presentation with Gunnar Sievertsen. We agree that I present our case and Gunnar will join the discussion. 
According to 2018 report by International Association of Scientific, Technical and Medical Publishers, there could be 70,000 academic scholarly journals in the world. And at one end of this wide spectrum are journals recognized in the scientific communities for having a strong and reliable uh, editorial and peer review standards and practices. At the other end are journals with no or weak or deceptive peer review, however defined. And between these extremes, there also exists a gray zone of journals whose peer review status is ambiguous in the sense that they exhibit uh, both reliable and questionable practices. The so-called questionable or predatory journals take advantage of the APC-based open access publishing model, claiming but failing to practice proper scientific quality control by experts in the field. Uh, while there is no universally agreed definition of questionable journal, white lists and black lists, as referred to in previous discussions already many times, have been relied on to steer researchers and evaluators between properly peer-reviewed journals and those failing the expected standards of academic rigor. Examples of international whitelists include, of course, DOAJ, the Directory of Open Access Journals, as well as the lists of Web of Science and Scopus Index journals. In some countries, including Denmark, Finland and Norway, also national authority lists developed to support performance-based research funding systems uh, have served the purpose of whitelists. Uh, on the other side, of course, there is the infamous Beals list, which, which is now defunct and source of the Scientometrics retraction case. The most uh, well-known international blacklist remaining is the Cabell's uh, Predatory Reports, uh, which checks journals based on more than 70 different uh, criteria. We can also mention that also DOHA has made available a list of journals removed on the grounds of suspected uh, editorial misconduct, but this of course is not meant to be used as a blacklist. Now there is an early warning list of 65 international journals published in 2020 by the Chinese Academy of Science. And this is an interesting intermediate solution highlighting journals with risk characteristics and potential uh, quality concerns. For example, just to give you fl flavor of the list, M MDPI journals figure prominently in this list, but so does also for example, APC-based uh, megajournal IIII advances. The criteria for inclusion include, among others, number of articles, internationality of authors, funding model, especially the APC, uh, as well as rejection, self-citation and retraction rates. Whatever the merits of the Chinese list, it enables us to show the possible shortcomings of the whitelists and blacklists when it comes to addressing quality concerns. And indeed, researchers and evaluation and funding systems relying on these lists should perhaps be concerned because the whitelists we analyzed approve almost all 65 journals, while these journals are almost all excluded from the blacklists, especially the Gappel's uh, predatory reports. We may also notice that some of the uh, journals are even included among the leading titles in the Nordic lists, one journal in Finland and four journals in Denmark.
In Norway and Finland, uh, there is a strong increase in the article output, especially in the MDPI and Frontiers journals. This development is undoubtedly great for open access, but it is also fair to ask if this increase at national level in the quantity takes place at the expense of quality. And is this a healthy development from the perspective of the open access costs and spending of public funds? Uh, to sum up, our main point is that the whitelists and blacklists are typically based on quite formal and technical criteria, which may not be able to sufficiently capture some of the quality concerns, such as raised, for example, by the Chinese list. In Denmark and Finland, for example, panels of experts are involved in the approval of journals to the authority lists. We call this appro approved level one. However, the experts may take an overtly cautious approach to handling of the gray zone journals because the lists are connected to national funding schemes. So there may be a strategy involved. We suggest that a possible solution for addressing quality concerns could be a list of recommendable journals with strong and well-recognized contribution to knowledge base and scholarly communication among expert research communities. Such lists should be based on assessment by experts in the field, perhaps informed with broad range of data about the journals, but the list of recommendable journals should be, in our view, unconnected to any assessment or funding system. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And also thank you for keeping the time so exemplary. So we actually have uh, some time now for uh, following up. But first we will do the last uh, poll here. And I will find this. Uh, let's see. Yes. Well, uh, there are criteria for for putting uh, journals or publishers in these whitelists and, and blacklists, and. Uh, Knowing these, of course, uh, publishers can then uh, use uh, uh, the, the knowledge about the, the, these criteria to tailor their journals. And researchers can also base their choices of, of journals based on what kind of journals these are. So the use of blacklists uh, and whitelists uh, could promote gaming with regards to uh, scholarly publishing standards. This is the question. Well, thank you very much. Uh, there's a quite even, and we will see this in a second, quite even share here. So it will be interesting to try to unpack the, the responses here. Maybe uh, those of you uh, who answered could also uh, put a question or a statement in the question box, and maybe we can help us uh, discern what, what uh, your uh, thoughts are. Let's see, it should come up any second. Yes. And uh, Janne or Gunnar, what do you say about uh, the uh, slight incre uh, larger share of, of disagreements, but uh, quite even? I think we asked about blacklists and whitelists at the same time, but uh, they function very differently. So that might be one, one reason. So a technical issue with how we frame our questions that is relevant.
but do you want to say anything uh, uh, from your position uh, about uh, your thoughts about uh, blacklists and whitelists? Uh, I think the experiences that you referred to recently have shown that attempts to create blacklists or warning lists can be easily attacked and difficult to defend against the industry because the, the proof, the, 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 the case of evidence will be on your side. And that's why we are talking about rather having lists of recommendable journals because recommendability is something that depends on, on the consensus within the academic communities. And Arletta asks, how do we define questionable journals? Not easy. The parallel solution to what I said about recommendable is that there is wide concerns independently among researchers about the outcomes of the editorial procedures with regard to research quality. I would say that that's a possible definition of questionable journals. Uh, I think it's important at this stage to talk about questionable journals rather than predatory journals. And this is because author payment is now all over and creating incentives on the publisher side to um, to not provide the editorial standards that we would expect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do, do anybody else want to comment on uh, this issue of uh, defining questionable journals? No. I can continue. Sure. Please. Yes, I know, I know uh, from the experience of working uh, now almost 10 years with the expert panels in Finland across all fields that, that this is also a difficult question for the expert panelists. And they, uh, they also have sometimes hard time to, to deciding on, on how to treat uh, some uh, gray zone journals, um, especially because typically they may not have uh, themselves any publishing or editorial or peer review experiences from those journals. But uh, also we know uh, from discussions uh, in our panels that this development, uh, uh, predatory publishing or questionable publishing and also the rise of APC based uh, publishing in case of some uh, commercial uh, publishers, it is really a cause for concern among our expert panelists. So this is, I, I think they would mostly agree that this is something that requires to be monitored. And, and as Raf uh, mentioned, one very good way of, uh, uh, of taking care of this uh, issue is simply raising awareness and discussion among the national research community. Why not also in the international research community about the question, what is questionable, what is not. Absolutely. May I respond to the question on the list here? It comes from Kerry Ming Li Chen. The black white lists of journals from national funders cause the issue of academic freedom again. It's important because, and this is why we said the, 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 the lists of recommendable journals cannot be connected to an evaluation and funding system. We, we try to return to the situation where a sen senior researcher recommends journals for the junior researcher. So this, this act of recommending should be preserved within academia. And these, uh, these joint Nordic lists of recommendable journals, they should not try to include all journals, but they should be just giving advice in this difficult situation. Um, and, and as I said, it's a kind of academic consensus uh, process. And of course, publishing outside of the list will be the responsibility of, of, of the researchers and the institutions that do so. 
Thank you very much, Gunnar. I can also add that uh, I am also of that belief that rather than focusing on the specific issues of using whitelists or blacklists, uh, it is uh, fostering good publish publishing practices, including um, uh, aligning with publishing with the broader ethos of, of the uh, well, the Mertonian ethos of science, making science public and uh, uh, criticizing it uh, and so on, and that these. Uh, also making sure that publishing is not seen as something uh, apart from the full research process. Publishing is part actually of, of doing research. And then uh, it, it, we could help uh, minimizing the ways uh, publishing is used only as a uh, system for, for funding or for uh, evaluating researchers, which might be problematic in many ways otherwise also. so. Um, uh, I think that we as scientometricians can help by employing scientometric practice in, in uh, evaluation and policy discussions in a way that improves sustainable publishing practices and aligning, uh, making it more aligned with the actual research process that is uh, uh, published on, so to speak. Uh, yeah. Is there anybody else who wants to comment on this issue? See otherwise what what questions we have. Um, well, there is a, a quite long question here, which says that there is a lot of focus on predatory publishers, but there are also big publishers, uh, more what we can call standard publishers, uh, that uh, uh, can be uh, pseudo scientific or uh, uh, have have um, questionable publishing practices, and. Uh, there might be a, a wider, uh, um, uh, wider issues with what is published and not uh, being published that may or may not be included under the heading of questionable publishing. Uh, does anyone who wants to comment on this? I can do so. I, I, I regard the question of questionable editorial pro um, procedures as more important than uh, identifying uh, journals with questionable science. And this is because um, incentives for the publishers to receive uh, author payment is so widespread now, globally. Um, so, um, I, I showed yesterday in my presentation that the total revenues from APC in 2020, I have estimated them to 3.6 billion last year among the 10 larger publishers. And some of those publishers that we have been discussing, discussing critically in this session are part of, of that list. And, and they are part of the good company, you know, uh, so that's why I think predatory journals is becoming a kind of a, a, a term that we have to uh, leave because it's clear that all those small journals outside the good company are predatory or maybe it's, you can see that. But the, the, the main industry now is taking over practices that might be just as questionable in the end. So my answer is simply to Craig that I think uh, questionable publishing practice are now at the time being more important than the question of non-science journals. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who wants to give a comment? I think we have maybe one minute left if there is something. Mm. Yes, if I may, um, I think that Jeffrey Beale did not do the research community um, uh, service when he focused with his lists to a large extent on publishers. Well, he also had a list of uh, standalone journals, but it's most he mostly focused on journals. Uh, uh, sorry, on publishers, and I'm not sure if that's the right uh, level we, we, we should be looking at since 
um, especially a large public, some of the larger publishers, if you look at uh, their their portfolio, not all their journals are managed uh, in the same way and the editorial processes are different. So I think it's perfectly possible that some publishers have both decent, uh, uh, well-edited journals, as well as journals that um, are quite questionable. Um, so I agree with the poser of the question in, in the sense that um, just focusing on predatory publishers is probably, um, yeah, it, um, paint, paints a wrong picture. Thank you very much, Raf, and that will be the last words for this session. And we thank you very much, all of you who asked questions, and uh, we look forward to talking to you in other uh, situations also. Okay, bye.